I think it's fair to say that this was surprising, at least to those of us who weren't in the know. Reflect a little bit on the legacy that Jim Bullard leaves behind. Well, you know, I think I've known Jim for almost 50 years, and uh, I've come to respect him greatly as an economist, as a president of the St. Louis Fed, and as an independent-minded member of the FOMC. And I, I want to really emphasize that. Uh, he's very transparent about his views. He writes about uh, important macroeconomic and macrodynamic issues, as well as monetary policy. And uh, the St. Louis Fed has always had a president who was quite independent-minded, particularly focused on inflation. And I think uh, Jim prides himself as being if not the most hawkish, a hawkish member of the committee when it comes to a period of bringing inflation down to the 2% objective. Uh, he speaks with great clarity. Uh, he's a great communicator. Uh, and as I said, uh, he's, he's a very good economist as, as well as a policymaker. I really like that characterization, independent-minded. Of course, we were talking about sometimes it feels like he likes to be the contrarian in the room, but as you say, very well known as a hawkish voice. And talk to us a little bit about how Fed policy is made, because of course, he's not a voter this year, but is very vocal. How does that shape the thinking of the board overall? Well, when you, you look at an FOMC meeting, you can't tell who's a voter and who's not. All the participants participate on an equal basis. And I would say all participants have an influence on, on what's going to happen, although only members of the FOMC vote. Uh, and uh, so uh, whether he's voting or not, he's a, an influential voice on the committee. And, uh, you know, as I said, he, he is particularly important today. Yeah. Uh, he's been uh, ahead of the curve here in terms of inflation and in terms of what monetary policy should be doing. And uh, uh, I'll be sad to see him going, but very happy. And I want to congratulate him on becoming the inaugural dean at the business school at Purdue University, an inspired choice, I would say. Uh, all right. Of course, uh, hitting close to home. I am curious, Larry. It's it's funny because everyone kind of talks about kind of how prolific Bullard was in terms of his uh, public appearances and public speeches. I mean, you had developed a reputation during your tenure as a uh, Fed governor for giving uh, quite a few speeches, quite a, quite a few lengthy speeches. And uh, I think uh, in hindsight, most Fed members appreciated what you brought to the table. But it was also a much different era. I, I mean, when you were doing this, I mean, Fed members did not go out in public in the same manner that they do today. So right. I have on my cabinet there uh, a little box that says Maya's long speeches that the staff gave me. So yes, <laughs> I wrote long speeches. That uh, That's true. And when I was there, almost nobody had the practice that I did of going out and giving quarterly talks on the outlook and monetary policy. Yeah. Uh, so that was, <laughs> that, that was sort of true. It's very different now. Uh, uh, FOMC members and, and board members and, and presidents are so much more active, uh, uh, talk a lot more than they used to, and are so much more transparent about their views than I ever was mm -hmm. as a member of the FOMC committee. Oh. Nobody. <laughs> well, I, I am curious. I mean, even you joke about kind of that, that thing, and we all kind of know the Christmas carols and, uh, you know, how everybody sort of joked about your speeches. But when people talked about that in hindsight, particularly after you left, there was this idea of just how substantive they were, that this wasn't just you pontificating, that there was a lot backing that up. And I'm wondering if you see that same substance in what we get from the Fed members today when they speak. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, some board members and presidents more than others. Uh, but the speeches are generally interesting, not just because they talk about uh, the issues relevant to monetary policy, uh, but because they give us insight into their own thinking and perspectives on the really important issues. And they're talking to me, and they're talking to markets, and uh, and there's more emphasis on that. Uh, they're less quiet. They give many more speeches than they used to. I remember the first thing that Greenspan told me when I said, how do you feel about me going out and giving speeches? He said, my first thing is don't go. <laughs> Second is if you go, don't move markets. Mm -hmm. Well, there's and I was back in his office a couple of times because of that.
Yeah, yeah, there's definitely uh, more press conferences, more speeches, as you point out. And in the speeches, of course, we hear a lot of maybe dissenting opinions, but then you look at the actual votes, and Powell has enjoyed relatively few dissents over the course of his tenure, even with those independent thinkers like Jim Bullard. What do you make of that relative harmony, at least when it comes to the, the voting? So first of all, it's always been the case that the chairman basically gets his, his uh, decision on the rate. And then the, the statement is negotiated over the period. Uh, but in this last meeting, you see how important it was for Powell to keep together a committee who had very divergent views uh, on this. It was a very mysterious decision uh, to skip the meeting and raise the terminal rate by 50 basis points. I called it bewildering, OK? And this is a testimony to, uh, uh, to Powell in keeping the committee together, avoiding dissents. Although, for my part, I would have preferred a few dissents.